Thank you very much, uh, Cassie, for that uh, overflowery introduction, indeed. <laughs> and it was, for me, a considerable uh, surprise, but a great privilege to be asked by Harry to speak at this meeting, and I'm grateful to her for all the help she has given me. And I uh, find it a great pleasure to talk at the 50th anniversary of the Institute, because as a very junior doctor, I worked with a lot of the people who founded the Institute and almost heard a lot of the conversations that uh, ended up with the Institute and its subsequent incorporation into the college here. Um, the Institute is, as you know, 50 years old, and it really developed like so many other groups from another group, and it was the obstetric section of the Royal Academy of Medicine in Ireland. But obstetricians have always had a close association with the college in academic terms, in teaching terms, certainly in examination terms, and also there have been 15 obstetricians as presidents occupying 23 presidencies, some of them being elected on more than uh, one occasion. And a lot of groups have developed out of parent-type bodies. 1654, our own college here, developed from the fraternity of physicians in Trinity Hall, attached to Trinity College, still our nearest academic neighbor. And much, much later, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the UK, to which the vast majority of Irish obstetricians have a very close affiliation, developed from the Gynecological Visiting Society. And our own institute, of course, developed from the obstetric section of the Royal uh, Academy of Medicine. Now, just going back to the early days, and this is to a certain extent what I've been asked to do, the Fraternity of Physicians of Trinity Hall was founded by John Stern, whose portrait is out in the Graves Hall in 1654. And this was, of course, the forerunner of this college. And even going back further, Trinity College, still on the same site as it was in 1592, was founded by Queen Elizabeth I, and she wanted it, and her people around her wanted it to remember, to resemble a Knoxbridge type of campus. The first mention of a medical degree was in 1616, with John Stern being first na named as a holder of a medical degree in Trinity, and of course the Fraternity of Physicians was established. The medical school opened formally uh, a bit later in 1711. Now, if we look at the contemporary scene, and it's always, I think, important to look at what else was going along at the time. In 1649, King Charles I, the son of James I, who we heard about in the Apothecary's Lecture earlier this morning, he was uh, executed. He had lost the Civil War in England, and his death warrant was signed by Oliver Cromwell. He was taken from the famous dining hall in uh, Whitehall, and he had a very good executioner because he was beheaded with one stroke. Curiously enough, following this, they uh, reattached his head. They sewed it back on, and uh, he's buried in St. George's Chapel in Windsor, scene of all sorts of recent weddings and so on. So it goes on. But Oliver Cromwell took over uh, with the Commonwealth and the Republic. He invaded Ireland in 1649, caused enormous amount of destruction in Wexford, particularly Drogheda and other places. And it was around that time that John Stern was founding this college, essentially. But the English didn't like the Republic and the Restoration with uh, Charles I's son, Charles II, happened in 1660 and the monarchy has been going uh, since that time, a lineal um, progression, not always a very straight line, but nonetheless a line. When we look at 17th century medicine, it was full of home cures, faith healing, quacks, barber surgeons, probably did a lot of damage, well, as perhaps some good, and a lot of self-appointed healers, and this is a lovely picture of one of these uh, healers here. 
And again, putting it into the uh, historical perspective, our college was founded then in 1654, and the big events that took place subsequent to that, the American War of Independence, this college was 121 years old when that happened. It was 135 years old when the French Revolution happened. And when the Easter Rising occurred, we were a very venerable institution of 262 years. John Stern was an amazing man, really. He uh, founded this fraternity of physicians. He was appointed the first chair of medicine in Trinity College, and he managed to get a royal charter for uh, this college here, the charter of Charles II. But it was a fairly limited charter because it restricted the activities of the college to Dublin and nothing further beyond, and it confirmed Stern as president for life, even though he didn't last very long after that, just two years. Another extraordinary person at the foundation of the college and kept the whole thing together, really, was Sir Patrick Dunn. He was born in Aberdeen, and Aberdeen, which had, I think, the fourth oldest university in the UK, it was hard to get to, as it perhaps still is, and you had to go by boat from London to Aberdeen because there were so many brigands on the way. But he studied medicine in France. He got an MD from both TCD and from Oxford, he was physician to the Lord Lieutenant, which gave enormous influence and power. And, of course, he was physician to King William III, uh, and uh, that was at the Battle of the Boyne. He had a huge medical practice, and he was president of this college, elected on 13 separate occasions. And he got the new charter, the uh, Mary, William and Mary Charter, Mary being their direct uh, descendant, and she signed it first. It was figured that this charter given was, to a major extent, the result that Dunn had over the king. And it was an important one because it extended the remit of the college to all of Ireland. Previously, the college had been rather Dublin-centric. It also extended the powers to Midifrey and to the apothecaries, which the apothecaries resisted in quite a big way. Uh, and with modifications, this is still the governing document of the college and all those times ago. As I said, there have been quite a number of obstetricians as president of this college, going back to 1734, and I've asterisked a few of them which I think are really important in the history of obstetrics and indeed in the history of the college, and just go through uh, a few of them because they were major contributors, certainly in my opinion. The first was uh, John Van Leeuwen. He was the first president, and he was interestingly present here, president here before Moss established the Rotunda Hospital, so a long time ago. He was a cork man, but like so many of those times, his medical education was at the famous school in Leiden. He was a physician who practiced as a successful man midwife. He had a vast private practice, apparently, but he died following a knife injury, and not a scalpel injury, a domestic knife injury that must have got infected and septicemia and so on. But the college was unhappy with all this obstetric midwifery stuff and passed a resolution uh, following his death that no man for the future shall have a license to practice midwifery and physic, that's medicine, together. Uh, and that caused a lot of contention, of course. Now, in 1742, Bartholomew Moss, who was the great obstetrician who founded the Rotunda Hospital, uh, he received the college licentiate in midwifery only. Moss opens his hospital. He was refused a license to practice medicine uh, because, in quotes, it was not consistent with the dignity of their body, this is this college, for a man to be allowed to hold both licentiates. Now, he was succeeded, Moss died, unfortunately, quite early, and he was succeeded by a, an intellectually powerful individual called Fielding Old in the Rotunda. And Fielding Old, who's present at the birth of the Duke of Wellington, uh, and he unsuccessfully petitioned for uh, ages to get both licentious, but without success, because the college took the view that midwifery was an inferior 
and unscientific part of medicine. And then another obstetric president came along, Francis Hopkins. And things had relaxed a bit by then in 1779 because he was allowed to hold both licentiates of the college. He was president of the RCPI and he finally allowed Fielding Old to get his double licentiate and he was a fairly old man at the time, uh, 75. Hopkins was curiously elected master of the rotunda after his presidency rather than most of them who had it the other way around. And then we come to Robert Collins, a really mighty man in terms of uh, obstetric practice, what he did and what he wrote. He got his MD from Glasgow, college licentiate from here, was master of the rotunda in 1826, he was treasurer of the college, and he was president of the college at the time of the famine. But he is noted, <coughs> and his writings are really extensive, for the reduction in maternal mortality consequent on puerperal sepsis. Puerperal sepsis was one of the scourges uh, of, um, of obstetrics and still is in most of the uh, developing world. But he figured that if you rotated the wards, if you painted the wards, probably in sort of whitewash, if you changed bedding and so on, that this uh, purple fever would uh, decrease enormously. And during the last three years of his 70-year mastership, there was not one case of maternal death consequent on purple sepsis. He recorded his three years as assistant master and his seven years as master in a wonderful publication, a book that's easy to read, easy to understand, and there are copies of it here in the, the library. His work really is so important, it predated the work of Semmelweis, who's widely credited with uh, the reduction in purple sepsis because he examined two hospitals in Vienna, one run by nurses, the other run by doctors, and the doctors, one had a much worse uh, result as regards maternal mortality, and it was consequent on the fact that uh, many of the doctors went straight from the autopsy room to the labor ward, and uh, the, that didn't happen in the nurses' hospital. But Semmelweis, even though the distances were huge in those days, knew the work of Collins and quoted him in, in many of uh, his publications. A very kindly man called Avery Kennedy I'd like to briefly discuss. He was born in Dublin. He succeeded Collins as master of the rotunda and continued his work on er the eradication of maternal mortality due to purple sepsis. With Collins, he also popularized uh, the use of the fetal stethoscope, which was a completely new innovation at that time. He also opened the first gynecological ward, and he was interested in education and postgraduate education, and he founded the Dublin Obstetric Society. That was the predecessor of the obstetric section of the Royal Academy, which was a predecessor of our institute, which we're celebrating today. Avery Kennedy. And then there was another very notable person, Fleetwood Churchill. Churchill was born in Nottingham. He was educated at home, apprenticed to a London surgeon, got his MD from Edinburgh, and he studied obstetrics in Dublin in the Rotunda. He was a prolific writer, teacher, a bibliophile, and he was president here in 1853. And it's interesting, around that time, Dominic Corrigan, who's commemorated with a window here and uh, this hall and uh, other portraits around the place. Uh, Corrigan set up a debenture scheme to uh, fund the purchase of this building for the college. And Fleetwood Churchill subscribed to that debenture scheme, uh, scheme, quite a lot of money in those days. And he was one of the persons who did not wish to... Uh, retrieve his debentures when the time was up and gave it as a gift to the college very generously. And he also donated his very considerable library to the college, which uh, is, is on display around this uh, building. We then come a little later to Sir Andrew Horne, uh, another extraordinarily uh, powerful figure in obstetric practice. 
He was born in County Galway, uh, prosperous parents, uh, uh, business people. He was educated by the Jesuits at Clongos and he at the Carmichael School of Medicine in Dublin. He studied at the Rotunda and also in Vienna, and he had a great interest in both anti- and asepsis. He really wanted to be master of the Rotunda, but was beaten for that position by one of his, his uh, friends. But he became the first joint master of the newly opened National Maternity Hospital, which was open to facilitate the care of women in the southeastern aspect of Dublin. He had a long association with both Hollis Street and indeed with this college. He was opposed to the election of female fellows and at a meeting, possibly in this very room, he said he wanted the motion turned down, not known unanimously, but with a huge majority. Uh, that was in 1908. And of course his fellow Clongonian, uh, Joyce, lampooned him on Bloomsday on the 16th of June, 2000, uh, 1904, in the section of Ulysses, the Oxen of the Sun. Uh, the Oxen of the Sun, a whole section, uh, that whole section is given uh, over to Hollis Street, where Horn was master at the time. They say, and I'm not a Joycean scholar by any means, it is the most difficult section in that rather difficult book, and it lampoons uh, the master of the rotunda, who was the bachelor, Dr. Purefoy, by talking about the labor of Mrs. Purefoy in uh, Hollis Street. He designated Hollis Street as the House of Horn after the then master, and apparently equates the growth of the fetus with the slow development of English prose. Take what you like out of that. The next one and last one I would like to discuss is Bessel Solomons. He was born in Dublin to Orthodox Jewish parents from the UK. His early life was acting and rugby. He was capped 10 times for Ireland, graduated 1907 from Trinity. He studied at the Rotunda and was a great traveler, traveled to most of the centers that were then important in Europe. He was the second vice president uh, of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in London. And one of the founders of that college, there were two of them, uh, Sir William Fletcher Shaw, in writing about the first hundred fellows, described Solomon as having the mystique of the Jew, the charm of the Irish, and the practicability of a Yorkshireman. He was pure CPI here in 1946, very just after the war, very, very active president. And like Horn, he's mentioned uh, by Joyce, but this time in that uh, extraordinary book, Finnegan's Wake, in my Bethel of Solomon's, I accush their rotundities, whatever that means. Now, just coming to the 20th century and postgraduate education, because postgraduate education is much of what the Institute is about, we had the obstetric section of the academy, and then there were various traveling societies. The first three are British, with quite a number of Irish members, and then in the 50s, the Doves, the Dublin Obstetric Visiting Society, was founded. And they were really the first CMEs, CPDs, postgraduate education, etc. The Dublin Maternity Hospital certainly did their bit as regards postgraduate education. The Rotunda from way back, the Coombe founded in 1826, but uh, moved to new premises just a year before the Institute uh, was founded, and the National Maternity Hospital hopefully shortly to move to, to another campus. In 1964, there was a move to have a new professional body. And at a council meeting of the obstetric section of the academy, Dr. Bertie Quain, who was then a single-handed practitioner in uh, Waterford, felt that there was need for a body to represent the needs of the specialty in Ireland, not just to deal with postgraduate education exams and so on. And quite a number of meetings were held over the ensuing number of years at the uh, rooms of uh, Dr. Sean Boyle at 35 Fitzwilliam Place to try and advance this project. And of course, 
the specialist doctors in those days inhabited Fitzwilliam Place and Fitzwilliam Square. It was the sort of Harley Street of Dublin. And Sean Boyle, who I think is credited with founding the Institute and its inception into this college, he worked at the Coombe Hospital. And this is a picture of the old Coombe Hospital, where I was a resident student in 1965. And it was a great privilege to be the, one of the last groups of students in the old Coombe. And I use the word privilege advisedly, because much of it was so absolutely awful. And, <clears throat> Uh, but this is where people like Sean Boyle worked, and the obstetrics, while it was better in the other two hospitals in terms of, of um, facilities, maybe, and buildings, uh, but the problems were much the same. The labor ward in this awful-looking building was... Uh, oh, sorry. The labor ward was on the, uh, the top floor there. The uh, wards were on the middle floor, and whatever administration that was done was on the ground floor. And I remember vividly uh, my eight weeks as a resident student in uh, the old Coombe, and this is where Boyle and others worked and what they would have been up against. It was certainly not fit for purpose, Deca decades of benign neglect. The poverty was absolutely extreme. It was deep in the liberties of Dublin, uh, the liberties of the Earl of Meath and supported by the Guinness family. Many mothers had little for themselves and even less perhaps for their babies. The voluntary organizations, the Linden Guild, worked overtime to provide for these mothers and babies on a voluntary basis. Anemia was almost ubiquitous. And my memory is of a lot of white-faced women worn out with parity. The grand mal tip, as we've heard this morning, was five plus, and then there was another coom thing called the great grand mal tip, which was eight plus, and that was the situation. And then there was the unmarried mother who was uh, everywhere, really, and she was cynically dignified with the term inupta, a Latin term, she who had not put on a veil. There was no epidural, there was no ultrasound, there was no lift. The women had to walk up six flights of stairs in labor to the labor ward. There seemed to be a lot of shouting. And then there was the gynecological chair, which the women of the liberties designated the horse. The teaching was experiential and clinical. And then there was the PPH. That's not postpartum hemorrhage. It's the pub past the hospital, where an awful lot of business was carried out. And when the institute was founded, 68, I was a first year SHO, the flying squad was still active, and many journeys to Port Leash, to Trim, Longford, and further afield. The district, the home births, were fading out. There was an awful lot of private nursing homes, which were visited uh, by, by the uh, consultants, both north of the river and south of the river. The county physicians did a lot of the obstetrics, with the county surgeon being called in to do the odd cesarean section. Ultrasound was not in Ireland. Laparoscopy was not in Ireland. Cytology was just starting, and there were enormous struggles to get that going. Chemotherapy was just starting with mesotrexate, then curing choriocarcinoma, the odd case of it. Contraception, as we've heard from the very elegant lecture this morning, was illegal, but the pill which had been uh, licensed by the FDA in 1961 was used as a cycle, reg cycle regulator. Never in the history of womankind have so many cycles been so irregular and for so long. <laughs> the midwives were female, the obstetricians were male, and the word gay had a completely different meaning. A new organization was discussed. Would it be an Irish college of ONG? No, there was probably not a critical enough mass there for that. A regional council of the RCOG? No, we were independent and wanted our own. Greater autonomy to the obstetric section of the academy? No, it had probably run its course. So to develop a faculty within this college, with whom, as I've already stated, obstetricians had a long association. And that was the one that won out in the end. 
There were four people involved. Sean Boyle, who I've already mentioned, worked in the old and the new coom. He was elected chairman because he was considered to be courteous and discreet. Joe Alvey from Hollis Street was the first honorary secretary. Bertie Quayne, the kind of shaker and mover from Waterford. And then John Cunningham, known as Divine John. The only thing he did, I think, was suggest the title Institute. Uh, there were informal meetings held with the then, then presidents of the RCPI, Drs. Pringle and Thompson, and the college solicitors. It's a, a, an important message because the first lot of solicitors didn't give the answer they wanted, so they just went and got another group of solicitors until they did get the answer they wanted. Yes, that the college could be incorporated as a type of faculty into this college. The first AGM was held in October 68, almost 50 years ago, just over 50 years ago. The first chairman was Professor Alan Brown from the Rotunda. And congratulatory letters were received from the then Minister of Health, Sean Flanagan, and the president of the RCOG, Sir John Peel, who was also the Queen's gynaecologist at the time. Just looking at 68, what was in the journals? That's meant to be plural then. Well, from the rotunda, George Henry was talking about amnioscopy. From Hollis Street, Niall O'Brien, first real neonatologist, was talking about bacteriuria. And interestingly, one of Connor's colleagues in uh, Port Yunkala was talking about anti-D uh, prevention of rhesus disease. Maternal Mortality Committee was most active with Arthur Barry uh, from Hollis Street as chairman. 61,000 births that year, 1968, and 21 maternal deaths. About the same number of births now, but many, many less maternal deaths. 50 years on, so, so much has happened. Unbelievable change. Most of it, the scientific obstetrics, has been of huge benefit to mothers, to babies, and to families. A huge benefit uh, of what's happened. There have been some adverse things that have happened, mostly that the medical legal situation uh, seems to me to be quite out of control. So that's a brief history of obstetrics and this college, and I'll pass it over to others to deal with 50 years until now. Thank you.